Journey to the West, an audio drama series. Production notes, episode three. Hello, dear listeners. This is Lin, the voice of the fifth monkey. This is my first recording after getting COVID. I'm fine now, but in case my voice sounds weird, this is my first recording after getting COVID. Can't you believe we're at episode three already? I hope you're all done listening to chapter three by now. We don't always have the time to cover everything from the main chapter in their corresponding production notes. So production notes are always about stuff in or before the corresponding chapter, but will never be ahead of them. So it's always better to finish listening to the main chapters first before coming to production notes. The central theme of this episode would again be names, but especially animal names. Yes, the most intriguing part of Journey to the West, biology. It's probably common experience, regardless of background, that、um, people from different places have different names for the same animal. Now that, plus the factor of time and language, makes it extra hard for us to find the right translation for a lot of the animals in the novel. An animal either exists in real life or only exists in legends. Either way, chances are. They don't have an equivalent name in the English language. Scientific names aside, common names for animals can get really messy. For example, in Chinese, you may have individual names for different fish, but in English, they may all share the same common name because they're from the same family, and vice versa.、Um, for example, what you call carp in English could refer to many different fishes in Chinese. Especially when a species is not common in your native land, you don't tend to further categorize them into more specific groups, because it simply isn't necessary. On top of that, names for the same animal often change over time, and sometimes all these names overlap and cause a lot of confusion. So we had one hell of a time just trying to find the closest English name for all the sea creatures mentioned in the chapter. We may still be wrong, but please let us know if you have better suggestions. In the drama, we translated "ma ho," literally "horse monkey," to "monkeys." We initially chose "baboon" as the translation because baboons have long, horse-like faces. But then we realized that baboons live in Africa, and there's just no way for a Ming Dynasty common man to know what a baboon is, save giving it a name. Scholars have suggested that maho is either another name for macaques or doesn't refer to an actual animal. Because we already have miho for macaques in the story, we chose to use the more generic term monkey for maho. Another monkey name we spent some time on was tongbei yuanho, elastic armed ape. The literal translation would be through back ape. Here we first need to take into account that the word for back, bay, and arm, b, look similar, and are pronounced similarly, resulting in them being used interchangeably in certain occasions. This being one of them. The character used in the novel is bay, meaning back, but according to the annotations by Mr. Li Tianfei, it actually refers to a legendary species of apes. Um, where their arms are said to be elastic, so when they extend one arm, the other arm gets shorter because the two arms are connected to one another. In his reference, the name used is Tong Bi Yuan Ho with Bi arm in the name. Since they're all referring to the same animal, and there is detailed description of their arms being the defining feature, we in the end chose to name it Elastic Armed Apes. And what about other legendary creatures?、Um, say, for example, Jiao and Peng mentioned in Chapter Three, Part Two. Jiao is basically a subfamily of Chinese dragons, and think of the largest legendary bird of your culture. And I know there usually is one. That would be the equivalent of Peng. We really would need to go further into this topic as more and more of them emerge. In the story, but in short, this is really a case-by-case process. Moving on, we have the mythical creature of Yecha, whose name originated from Yaksha, 
which is a broad class of legendary beings from Hindu and Buddhist texts. Um, they have many different forms and isn't clearly defined as good or bad. However, in Journey to the West and the wider Chinese context, Ye Cha as a creature has been one prominently related to water, hence them serving as guards of the Crystal Palace, and two portrayed as terrifying and often evil creatures. Like we discussed in the last episode of Production Notes, because they have been given specific characteristics in Chinese culture, we will be calling them by their localized name, Ye Cha, and not the Sanskrit name of Yaksha. Another interesting example would be Oxet and Horseface, two well-known figures of the underworld. So in Chinese, especially classical text, plurality is often implied, but not specified. You sometimes can tell from the get-go if a name refers to one individual or many. In the case of Oxted and Horseface, they are just two individuals. There is just one guard in hell named Oxed, who has a human body with an ox's head. And there's just one guard in hell named Horseface, who has a human body with a horse's face. But in both the Yu and Jenner translations, they refer to both names in the plurality, as if many ox heads and horse faces work in hell. That isn't the case in common Chinese lore, which is why we made it clear that their names were two specific characters, and not the name of a group. Such mix-ups are sure to come up in the future, and we will let you know when they appear. Next up, still in the topic of names, the Ten Kings of the Underworld. You may have noticed that we didn't translate their names at all, and just gave you the names in Mandarin. Both the Yu and Jenner versions made the attempt to translate some of their names, but also had to leave some of them the way they are because there simply wasn't a clear way to appoint meaning to every single name. The main reason for us to completely give up translating is because some of the kings actually have multiple names that sound similar, but are written differently. When written differently, the meaning of the name also changes, which is just extra confusing. The beginner reader just has to know that Yan Luo Wang, King Yan Luo, is just another name for Yan Wang, or King Yan, the most well-known king among the ten. All ten kings have different origin stories and lore surrounding them, and they are in charge of different things, but King Yan is most often the one who represents them. In Chinese, we sometimes call the ten kings Shi Dai Ming Wang, which could be translated to ten generations of underworld kings. But know that these ten people are not biologically related, nor are they connected by inheritance. They are ten completely different individuals whose origins fall in different eras, and they're basically colleagues who work on equal terms with different responsibilities. Moving on to less gloomy topics, the names of the four valiant generals. They're named Ma, Liu, Beng, Ba, and scholars have always tried to figure out why. Ma and Liu are actually very easy to understand. In many dialects, Ma Liu and its various forms are simply alternative names for monkey. In Cantonese, for example, we still call monkeys Ma Lou. As for Beng and Ba, however, the source remains unclear. Mr. Li Tianfei in his annotations suggested that it may be related to languages that enter China through ethnic minorities. As for now, there is no conclusive explanation to what they mean exactly. But as we discussed before, it isn't always necessary, nor is it possible to have an explanation for everything. Maybe Beng and Ba just sound fierce or fun for two monkey generals. Maybe an unnamed storyteller came up with it one day during his show. Who knows? Next, if you are sensitive to contradictions, you may have also noticed that in Chapter 3, Wukong said he would pay for whatever weapon the Dragon King could find, but in the end, of course, no transaction was made. I mean, I wouldn't call this a contradiction. This is very much just a case of Wukong being a silly asshole. He was playing nice, but he didn't really mean it. Moving on, we come to the entry of Sun Wukong on the Register of Life and Death. 
In the audio drama, we said his name was written under the heading of Hun, meaning soul. However, according to Mr. Li Tianfei's annotations, several earlier versions of the novel use the character Huai, meaning the Chinese scholar tree, as heading. Huai actually makes a lot of sense since it is listed in Tianzi Wen, the Thousand Character Classic, a text that was often used to index documents. Other versions, either by mistake during copying or on purpose, use the similarly written Hun because it makes just as much sense, if not more, given the context. We went for Hun instead of Huai, but just know that both characters are accepted and there is no right or wrong. And finally, a call back to our theme today. Let's talk about the character Chong. In modern Chinese, this character almost exclusively means bugs and insects, but in classical text, as you can tell from the documents Wu Kong read in the Underworld, Chong is in fact an umbrella term for all animals and beasts. Only when it's called Kun Chong does it refer only to insects. Some of you may be familiar with the name Da Chong, the big beast, which is an old-fashioned way to call tigers. The chong, meaning animals in the general sense, has actually appeared in quite a few places already, and the English translation has at least once translated it to insect. That is especially awkward when it's being listed alongside large mammals like tigers and leopards. So context is especially important. If it's among big mammal names, chances are this chong is also referring to big mammals, and not. You know, bucks. And phew, that was a lot of names that we covered. Before we send you off, please remember, as we discussed from the last episode of production notes, numbers don't always refer to its literal amount. Rather than converting them to modern units, focus instead on the impression they're supposed to give you. Big, small, long, short. Think in those terms, and you'll be ready to go. And now let's call it a day here, shall we? We would like to thank Patreon Sarah R for sponsoring this episode. Yes, we have a Patreon page, and don't forget to 一键三连 or subscribe. This is the Fifth Monkey, and thank you for listening.